Hello and welcome to Real Biz. I'm Rebecca Jarvis here in New York City and on our radar today, there's one thing every author wants to be on a bestsellers list, but with almost one million books published every year in the U.S. alone, how do you get there? Well, today we bring you two authors from two totally different worlds who have made a career out of writing and not just writing, writing what they want to write about. How did they do it? That is our question today. Nicholas Carlson is Business Insider's chief correspondent and the author of Marissa Meyer and the Fight to Save Yahoo. In his new best-selling, highly lauded book, Nicholas shares a revealing account of Marissa Meyer's rise to power as CEO of Yahoo and her greatest pitfalls and triumphs and explores whether Yahoo is actually a company that can be saved. Nicholas, welcome to Real Biz. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it's, it. It's great to have you, and, and I, I really enjoyed the book. It's full of insight, and it's clearly full of, I would say, years worth of research on your part. That's right. How yeah. did you do it? What, what was your process of pulling all of this together? Right. So really, it started back in, well, I've been covering Yahoo and AOL and Google and these internet companies since 2006. And it's just classic uh, shoe leather reporting, really, on some level. You know, So there's an executive at Yahoo I want to get in touch with. You know, I bugged that person for months at a time until the first, finally they say to me, like, fine, I'll talk to you. Uh, and that's sort of how you develop sources and, and you go forward with, uh, you know, that's how you end up writing a book like that for sure. As a, as a journalist has right. to do, just pound the pavement and exactly. be persistent and also hear the word no a lot and keep working till <laughs> yeah. it becomes a yes. Yeah, you have to be okay with no and, and being told to shoo and go away and, and just keep trying anyway. Marissa Meyer is like a Hollywood CEO. She's been in mm. Vogue, she wears beautiful clothing, she goes to great events. She certainly is very high profile beyond just her status as the CEO of Yahoo, but what was it specifically about her story that attracted you? Well, for starters, it was that. I was at a wedding in October 2012, just after she was hired as a college friend's wedding. And across the table, there's a college classmate of mine that I wasn't really close to, but, but, but remembered a little bit. And she said, I've been reading everything you've been writing because you've been writing about Marissa Meyer. And this person was not in media, was not in tech, was, was in industry, and she just sort of admired Marissa Meyer. I was like, ah, there's something here there. Um, and so, so that and then also she is just this person who's full of contradictions. So as much as she is glamorous and she is in magazine uh, you know, profiles and she's, you know, there's this one famous picture where she's in Vogue where she's lying upside down on a chaise lounge and she's like staring directly into the camera. She's also someone who shows up to, there's a scene in my book where she shows up to the meeting where she signs a $200 million contract. She shows up at a 10 year old BMW, her hair's wet. Uh, you know, these fancy New York types who are there to like help her, shepherd her through this process are like, oh Marissa, do you need help cleaning out your uh, office at Google, and do you need a car? She's like, no, I'll just drive myself, and my mom's going to be there. You know, she's <laughs> my just... mom's going to be there, and exactly. she even has a lot of phone calls with her mom that yeah. you share in your book. Yeah, absolutely. She calls her mom all the time. Like uh, they, they speak. I think it's like once a, once a day, maybe even once a week. Uh, definitely, she she like at one of like the the darker moments of Yahoo, her mom was like saying to her, "Are should you should you be so confident?" And she's like, "Mom, I got this. I, I feel like we're going to be able to do this." I, one of the things that struck me, first of all, the book does not focus a lot on the fact that she's a woman. She doesn't focus a lot on the fact that she's a woman, but I do wonder if if she had happened to be a guy, hmm. would we be as interested no. in her story? No, no way. I mean, because it is actually very interesting that in, a, in an industry that's sort of like, unfortunately, dominated by men, where like, you know, here's a 39-year-old woman who's worth $700 million and is pregnant when she becomes CEO. That's fascinating. And so for sure, she gets more attention because she's a woman. What do you think is the smartest thing she's done so far? Well, I mean, the smartest thing Meyer has done is really fix Yahoo's culture. When she got there, people were leaving the office at 4 p.m. on Thursdays. Uh, they weren't showing up again until Monday, mid-morning. Really, it's funny. And then um, she started to she you know, she gave away free food. She gave out you know new iPhones, and she also like got in the product meetings and really took the company by the lapels. Really a bottoms up sort of method. And you know within six months, people were there late Friday, mm -hmm. early Monday. She just immediately she kind of took the Google culture. Yeah, a focus on product, yep. the free food, the good stuff. And, and made that more of the Yahoo culture. Totally, is that's it's exactly what she did. I mean, there's this one scene in the book where she's just sitting next to uh, an executive and just for 45 minutes grilling them on, on the ins and outs of why uh, Yahoo email is set up the way it is, what data is he using, what research. And finally, you know, like eventually, she decides this guy knows what he's doing. She starts to trust him and they go forward. But like she was just in it in a way that Yahoo CEOs previously had not been. Number one piece of advice to someone out there who wants to write about a topic they love like you did 
and get it published as a book. Yeah, I mean, I think you know that if you have the right education, which is like number one in the world. But if you have the right education and can write pretty well, it's just a matter of time and effort, you know, and really wanting it. You have to want it more than you want other things, you know. <laughs> like so, you know, like that has to be the career path you really want, and you just stay focused on it for like ten years, you know. And ten then, years. Yeah, I, I think so. And then eventually, you'll be in an opportunity to write. You'll have an opportunity to write a book for sure. You just actually have to like sort of say that you want that above everything else in that you might have in a professional you know world Nicholas Carlson great advice great book congratulations thank you I know what a process it had <laughs> to have been congrats thanks, thanks for, for having me thanks for being here well our next guest is also a journalist but with a very different story to tell Roger Cohen is an award-winning author columnist and the former foreign editor with the New York Times he has dedicated his career to writing about war and lives. But in his new book, The Girl from Human Street, the focus is his story, charting his family history from Eastern Europe to South Africa to London to Israel and the U.S. Roger's book takes you on a beautiful journey that explores feelings of displacement and his mother's depression. It is a deeply personal book, and I want to congratulate you on it, Roger, and also thank you for joining us from London. Thank you very much, Rebecca. This was quite a departure for you. You're so accustomed to exploring the lives of others. Why focus in on your own story? Well, I've been running all my life, Rebecca. I've been running to war zones and covering displaced people. And it occurred to me that the most dangerous state for me was to be still, it was stillness. And I also felt the need to look inward. Um, my mother had been uprooted from her native South Africa, from a tightish Jewish community there plonked down in London and she'd had a breakdown when I was very young. I knew very little about it and I thought I could explore the story of her life and wider themes of displacement, movement, identity, belonging in the Jewish community and beyond. And one of the things you write about is that Jews learn selectively from the past just like everybody else. What did you yeah, mean? Yeah, that's right. Well, Go ahead. I, what, I, what I meant by that was that uh, my family uh, moved from Lithuania. There were Lithuanian Jews who moved to South Africa. And of course, being white in South Africa, uh, the Jews were privileged. That was an unaccustomed position after the pogroms in Eastern Europe. Uh, but they found themselves confronted by a system, apartheid, in which they saw another persecuted people, the blacks. Uh, most Jews in South Africa, nevertheless, went along. The official Jewish community uh, went along. So I wanted to make the point that we all learn selectively, and uh, not all of us are heroes. In fact, few of us are. Which is an interesting point, because when you're going back and looking over your own family history, not everyone can be a hero. And it, it had to have been, in particular, talking about your mother, who is the girl from Human Street, potentially very tough to look at her and look at her experience through unbiased eyes. Yeah, well, I think, Rebecca, there are books you choose to write and books you need to write. And my mother's story, she died 15 years ago. She was born on Human Street in South Africa, and she'd suffered uh, what was then called post puerperal psychosis, now called postpartum depression after the birth of my younger sister, and she then suffered from manic depression, uh, bipolar condition uh, for the last 25 years of her life. And I needed to know her story. We all have something that makes us tick. Uh, for me, it's words. Uh, for me, when I feel a knot inside me, I have to write it out of myself. And that's what I tried to do uh, in this book. And uh, it was a necessary thing. Uh, for me, and I hope, um, I think mental illness is the last taboo. I also think we live in a world where much of humanity is on the move, and the question of what is home, where do mm -hmm. I belong? Belonging is a very fundamental thing for most people. I think it comes right behind love for many people. Where do I belong? Where is my home? And I think that's a lo question a lot of people across the world are posing themselves today. My book tries to give some answers. Absolutely. I know I, I'm somebody who's asking it. I think that pretty much everybody around me is thinking <laughs> about this question because you have the physical and then you have the social media sphere, which can essentially make you live anywhere and make your life anything that you put out there for people to consume. 
Yeah, I think uh, obviously things have changed enormously through technology. When my family left Lithuania in the 1890s and moved to South Africa, that was it, end of contact. Uh, now, many families, of course, let's say here in Britain, uh, Pakistanis who move from Pakistan to Britain, they kind of live between the two. They're remitting money, they go back and forth. And the issue of what what home is where we belong in these globalized world, this globalized world uh, is a difficult one for many people. And I think in Europe, obviously, uh, we're seeing some of the difficulties Muslims and others feel in belonging. They feel alienated. And that's what's drawing some of them into these uh, movements of zealotry and hatred that give them a sense of mission. I wish we could get more deep into that topic, Roger, but I want to come back to something that you mentioned a few moments ago, which was the ability to write about something that makes you tick, your need to write. And I think that there's probably a lot of people watching right now who think, wow, to be in Roger Cohen's shoes, to be able to write about that thing that makes you tick, that you actually care about, no editor is telling you to do something a certain way, there isn't somebody looking over your shoulder saying, this is the book you have to write, you got to choose this one and you've gotten to choose so much of your work. What's your advice to people out there who say, I want to do that, I want to be that? Well, above all, do what you believe in, follow your heart. Uh, don't try and construct some artificial route that you think will lead you to the place you want to be. I think you've got to do what you believe in and follow it relentlessly. In my case, I thought if I could get somebody long ago now to pay me to go around the world and write about it, uh, that would suit me fine because I like <laughs> to observe, I like to write. And one thing led to another as it does in life. And I, I still think that the world has changed a lot, but I still think if you don't have that fundamental conviction, deep belief that this is what you want to do and are capable of doing and are willing to pursue it relentlessly, if you don't have all that, then it's going to be difficult. But if you do, maybe not the first time, maybe not the second, but at some point, somebody will recognize that unique talent in you and give you the avenue in which to express it. Smart words from an author and a journalist who did just that. Roger Cohen, thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you so much for joining us for Real Biz. We want to hear from you. Do you have a story to tell, but you don't have the slightest clue how to get it published? Well, let us know and then be relentless, just like Roger Cohen and Nicholas Carlson said. We want to hear from you. Also, like us at Rebecca Jarvis. Comment below. And from the studios in New York City, I'm Rebecca Jarvis. Have a great day.